So yes, good afternoon everyone and welcome to the weaponization of language and this uh, uh, panel, um, which I think is like moving into some really uh, central questions of this year's face value theme. Uh, personally, I'm looking very much forward to it. Some of you might, as me, have been down in the discussion, conversation between uh, Florian Karma and Angela Nagle, and there was a very energetic kind of, uh, I think, uh, atmosphere discussing some of the questions that will be continuing uh, uh, with a more specific focus on language in, in this panel. And uh, uh, when we think about uh, face value, uh, we think about kind of a resurgence of uh, on a very general uh, level about the theme, the background is kind of addressing also resurgence of a far right into the political mainstream. Uh, also a mobilization of language uh, in writing and in speech through different media channels, not the least the social media of course. But beyond the obvious, beyond, beyond kind of the issue also of hate speech, which will be also a topic here, uh, actually an early inspiration for this, this thematic was um, uh, statements, uh, and I'm using this example of Theresa May's statement that Brexit means Brexit when asked what Brexit means, and when pushed further, she answered Brexit means Brexit because it means Brexit. And this, this tautological kind of statements that refer only back to themselves, uh, trying to be kind of self-evident by a circular logic, uh, which actually kind of leads nowhere, it evades mechanism of exclusion. Uh, that's a mode of speech that seems to be uh, quite uh, typical, of course, of populist speech. And I think we can extend that into a reflection on how we also use online media platforms, uh, supporting also this kind of communication, communicational uh, culture of short statement, a communicational culture of face value, if you so will. So it's with this kind of background in mind that uh, uh, I think we can ask questions about language, its possible crisis today, which is of course always a crisis, I think, but uh, thinking about its specificity in relation also to the media platforms and infrastructures of today um, and their different kind of rhetorics. And of course also the question of the possibility uh, or even validity of trying to speak back today. Um, and well, the uh, panel will be moderated by uh, Nelly why Pinkra or U Pinkra, and she's a cultural media theorist as well as a political activist engaged in different projects. She's working on topics that connect uh, digital culture, black feminist uh, theory, decolonial coloniality, uh, and cultural history. She's a research his, uh, assistant at the Leuphana University Lüneburg, and she's writing a thesis on Edouard Glissant and cybernetics. Uh, and she also organized in 2013 the Conference of the German Society of Media Studies. And since then, she's also been working at the Center for Digital Cultures at Leofana University. So please welcome Nelly and uh, the speakers. Thank you. Yes, hello. Uh, first of all, thank you, Christopher for the kind introduction and uh, also to both you and Daphne Dragona for inviting me to this panel, to moderate this panel, which I'm very flattered to do actually, both because of the incredible speakers and also the topic uh, they are going to cover today. Um, so our speakers are Sibylle Kremer, Faisal Davji and Nick Thurston. And I'm going to tell you quickly what happens uh, within the next 90 minutes or so, even less by now. Um, so, I will start with a very brief introduction. Uh, I don't want to steal too much time, so I'll try to be brief. Um, and then each of our speakers will talk for 15 minutes, give an input. Uh, I will introduce all of them right before that. And then afterward, uh, we would like to dive right into discussion. And we agreed upon opening the discussion and the panel immediately after all the talks. So as probably most of you already know, there are two microphones in the middle of the aisles installed here. And we would like to invite you to use them. Don't be shy, um, engage in conversation with us. We would be very happy. And I, I'll try to be attentive and uh, notice you also. Yes, so I'll start now and uh, I'm very happy and excited for the next 90 minutes. <laughs> 
So I'll start uh, the introduction by reading a quote from the great and self-proclaimed uh, black, lesbian, mother, warrior, and poet Audre Lorde. Uh, this quote is taken from a speech he gave in 1977 at the Modern Language Association in Chicago. Uh, and it would later become the text, The Transformation of Silence into Language and Action. I have come to believe over and over again that what is most important to me must be spoken, made verbal and shared, even at the risk of having it bruised or misunderstood. That the speaking profits me beyond any other effect. And where the words of women are crying to be heard, we must each of us recognize our responsibility to seek those words out, to read them and share them and examine them in their pertinence to our lives. That we not hide behind the mockeries of separations that have been imposed upon us and which so often we accept as our own. So there can be no reflection on politics that does not pass through language today. The mediating role and power of language, as is with every medium, uh, often remains hidden or ambivalent, at least. The current conjuncture of, of a discourse on it is certainly enforced by the rise and or reappearance of uh, racism and fascism, populism, right-wing parties, authoritarian regimes, hate and terrorist groups, and they're operating through social media, networks, online forums, and media outlets. They manipulate persuade, propagate, advertise, contest, and provoke to, do, to dominate the discourse through their practices of uh, reinterpretation, relabeling, and meaning shifting, all of which we would, in certain other situations, call subversive practices. So we're seeing a change in the meaning of concepts and descriptions. Language is being used to obscure truth and facts. In fact, we are all, by now, are being called victims of the so-called post-truth and post-fact era. But by saying uh, language is being used to obscure truth, I also mean the very concept of language itself, which is being ridiculed by constructing it as that which is supposedly all of the things uh, that the enemies are keeping secret. So the enemies in the left or the, in Germany we call it <clears throat> the Lügenpresse, the lying press, um, or whatever. So this doesn't mean that there is a lack of truth actually in political debate, but actually there is an overflow. It seems that there is a thinking in headlines and buzzwords and forum titles, as we can perfectly see in, in Nick Thurston's uh, exhibition, The Hate Library, <clears throat> um, and that allow for an idea to maybe be expressed in a way or a lie to be written down or an already made judgment to be articulated, but for any explanation, any uncertainty or doubt or ambivalence or room for critical engagement, there is neither a space nor time nor actual nor an actual incentive in a way. So truth then becomes everything you want to be true. It's not a part of negotiation anymore, but practically the affirmation of one's own worldview and thinking. Victor Klemperer taught us how the constant presence of linguistic brutality um, created by constant repetition, even in small doses, ensures that their patterns settle in our heads. And as Faisal Devji writes in his contribution to the Transmediale uh, publication, conspiracies attain the status of being true only by being repeated over and over again and by being affirmed by masses of people and certain media outlets. So the value of language in, in, in a digital age, where words become commodities and liquidity of language is compromised, as is shown in the wonderful work, uh, theoretical and practical work of Pip Thornton, is changing the status of algorithmic processes, filtering mechanisms, information circulation, and conglomerate private companies become staggering in their role in how defining works what we consider to be is the relation between truth, meaning, information, and data. So I actually started this introduction by using this quote from Audre Lorde, um, because I think it's crucial to stress this kind of power of language, namely an empowering uh, quality in this very contemporary situation uh, or very specific moment in history. <clears throat> 
uh, which is the moment we're living in right now. So a very pressing question probably is what this situation is in the first place. And I personally just have spilled out some of the determinations um, I just did. And there are certainly countless more uh, that will label the situation, name it, uh, tell us about it, and name all the problems, offer solutions. Yet, there are also those that are much more careful to determine anything and everything just by virtue of having certain uh, concepts and buzzwords flowing around or at hand. So I'm actually definitely normally part uh, of the latter group, for I believe it is vital to question and be aware of the language one uses, how one uses it, how it is used by others, how it uses us also, um, when, where, and how far one is limited by it, and also um, how it can be utilized to be heard, to be empowered, to create understanding of each other and of the world, and to figure out how we can actually know things at all. So I think um, some of these aspects will be addressed in this panel today. I'm really excited to hear all the talks. And um, yeah, I think the weaponization of language is actually manifold. And we will hear about it from all of you. And so we will start with Sibylle Krema. Um, Sibylle Krema is professor of philosophy at the Free University, Freie Universität Berlin, Free University in Berlin. She has been a visiting professor at universities in Tokyo, Vienna, Graz, Zurich, and Lucerne. She was a member of the scientific panel of the European Research Council in Brussels, also the Senate of the German Research Foundation, as well as a permanent fellow at the Wissenschaftskolleg zu Berlin. You have been uh, a fellow at many institutions throughout Germany, and your interests are fields of working lie in epistemology, rationalism, media philosophy, and theory of cultural techniques. So with that, I will leave the floor to you. And please join me in welcoming Sibylle Krema. Thank you. Thank you, Nelly. Uh, we decided to stand up and I'm the experiment if this works, because it's a little bit difficult. One hand, the microphone, the other, my paper, because it's not my mother tongue, I have to read it. Okay, to speak of weaponization means language is power, force, violence. The German word, the German word, Gewalt, has a double sense. In one dimension it means violence, brute force, something destructive. In the other, it is official power, Amtsgewalt, Gewaltenteilung, it is official power in the sense of an administrative authority, something governmentally constructive. The guiding idea of my speech is that this difference between destructive violence and constructive power can be found with regard to language too. On the one hand, it's about the power of language to wound and insult people. On the other hand, it is about the power of written language as instructions to govern machines, to bring them to operate. The goal of my statement is to give an explanation why these two functions can be done by language alone. Isn't language, as we say in German, Schall und Rauch, sound and smoke? Why is it possible that we can hurt by speech? A word is not a thing, not a stone, it is not a weapon in the physical sense. Yet hate speech, personal offense, abuse, discrimination in language is an everyday phenomenon. And this is not a modern, not an internet problem but a phenomenon associated with language in general. The philosopher John Austin called his 1962 book, How to Do Things with Words. He has shown that in speaking, we can not only describe the world, but transform the world at the same time. He called this the performative dimension of language. Normally, to use language in a performative way depends on being socially 
authorized to do this. Thus, the judge can speak a judgment, a priest can marry couples, the president more or less can declare war. But to insult somebody by words does not depend on being socially author authorized, but is an everyday occurrence. How does that work? The author, Ernst Kantorowicz, spoke of two bodies of the king. But this quality of having two bodies is common to every human being. On the one hand, we have a physical body and we have a symbolically constituted body on the other. As a physical being, we occupy, occupy a place in space and time. To have a place means to be dis displaceable. Displacement from the physical position that is expulsion is the prototypical scene of material violence. The point is here that even our symbolic body has a place. It is the symbolic position we occupy within a society, within the formal and informal networks of social interactions and relationships. To have a name and an address is a symptom of being a bodily entity in a social net. One page. <laughs> Sorry. The important thing is that the symbolic place is not given once and for all, but based on and produced by recognition by others. The recognition is denied where social interaction turns into hate, discrimination and insult, an act of violence happens that displaces a person from the place that he or she occupies as a symbolically constituted corporal being. Remind that the physical and the symbolic dimensions both are modalities of human corporality. This is the reason that symbolic violence always has a somatic effect that is directly affects physical well-being or suffering. When we realize that the symbolic body is determined by its location in the net of social interactions, it also becomes clear, trivial or clear why digitalization enhances hate speech and symbolic insult. The electronic web is a space of resonance and reinforcement, a magnifying mirror. If our symbolic position in society depends on the place in the digital network of social media, and this may be a genuine function of social media, then aggressive actions that damage us as participants in social networks become so effective. Usually, violent language is considered as abuse, as a deformation of communication. The ordinary and the violent use of language seem to relate to each other like culture and barbarism, like something good and something bad. But this picture is much too simple. We have to remind that violent speech is also a cultural asset and is an integral part of our aesthetic, political and religious traditions. Historically and culturally, the pamphlet, critical comedy, the tearing, the biting polemics are always part of the culture of debating. How can violent language be resisted? How can it be combated? We have to distinguish two kinds of possible interventions. Interventions aiming at prohibition, located in the area between political correctness and jurisprudence. Its risk is censorship and restriction of freedom of expression. Second, 
Interventions aiming at subversion of, by repeating injurious words by its addressees on stage, by turning their violent potential as, for example, in aesthetic political practices such as hate poetry. Now to the machines. Not, not only persons, even languages have a material body. Its materiality consists in inscribed signs. Once language takes on the form of writing, it can become not only a device to communicate, but a tool of thinking and calculating. Think of the decimal position system invented by Indian mathematics and brought to the Europeans by Arabic scholars. Hindo-Arabic numerals make it possible to calculate numbers without the help of an abacus or calculation board. Yet the philosopher Leibniz brought numbers back to machines. He invented the binary system, the ideal code for instructing a machine because it is translatable, as you all know, into electrical and optical signals. Now, machines are possible that can be controlled by language. To get the power to make machines run, language, as we know, has to be written down. To be writing is to be discrete, non-continuous, to be a non-continuous symbolic system. Spoken language in its fluidity is not discrete, yet Alphanumeric writing is the prototype of the digital. The principle of digitality consists of the decomposition of a continuum into discrete elements and the arbitrary rearrangement of these elements. Formalization and digitalization are two sides of one coin. Long before the invention of the computer as an external machine, we developed the computer within us, so to say, the real personal computer, by using paper and pencil and formal science systems to perform complex cognitive work. The word personal computer was originally founded to describe women doing lots of calculations in the pre-age of com computerization. But with digitalization, the power of language, which is inherent in algorithms, gets a high price. Writing and calculating on paper means operating, so to say, in a completely controllable two-dimensional space. This surface space is the product of the cultural technique of flattening out as a vehicle of artistic and scientific activity. But as soon as the paper page transforms into the graphic user interface, depth is coming back. A backside is created that is only directed at machine interactions and data networks, all completely con uncontrollable to the user sitting in front. The genuine transparency of a written and readable surface has become the opacity of interacting algorithms only controlled by technical protocols within the infinite dimensions of the web. And with the ongoing disappearance of the interface into a sensory charged environment, the process of opacity and non-transparency will be multiplied. The modern form of language as an administrative authority, so to say, is machine language acting in the depths of technical protocols and data flows invisible and inacceptable by, inaccessible by users. That's my short story 
about the two faces, so to say, the Janus head of language as machine power and human violence. Thank you. Thank you, Zabili Krima, for this input. Um, we will continue with Faisal Devji. Um, <clears throat> Faisal Devji is a reader in modern South Asian history and fellow of St. Anthony's College at the University of Oxford. He is interested in Indian political thought uh, and in ethics and violence in the global arena. Uh, you have been the author of four books. I will read quickly. Uh, Landscapes of the Jihad, Militancy, Morality and Modernity, The Terrorist in Search uh, of Humanity, Militant Islam and Global Politics, The Impossible Indian, Gandhi and the Temptation of Violence, and uh, Muslim Zion, Pakistan as a Political Idea. So we're very happy to have you. Welcome, Faisal Dirji, please. You know, when we um, tend to talk about all strong emotions, whether love or hatred, we tend to presume, if I might presume using the word we for this presumption, we tend to presume uh, that these emotions or these strong feelings are linked uh, to a spatial logic of depth and surface. That anything that's likely to be strong, such as hatred or indeed love, comes out of the depth somehow, it's something deep within one. Um, now, on the one hand, of course, this is simply a trick of language where we spatialize uh, a psychic life that might not, as it were, uh, um, uh, be so comfortable uh, in, uh, in a two-dimensional world. Uh, but on the other hand, there's a kind of metaphysical background uh, to this vision of depth and surface. Uh, and you can imagine how it might have been the case that um, ideas of goodness, moral goodness or divine goodness were envisioned as coming from above and sinful and bad ideas or feelings um, uh, emerging from below. Um, but what if we say, maybe perhaps experimentally, what if we suggest that exactly the opposite might be? Uh, if not true, then at least provide us a more interesting way of looking at um, strong emotions such as hatred or love. What if it's not depth but surface that is of interest here? So if we um, turn away from this commonplace vision of hatred and love being linked to depth, to the language of depth, um, uh, and move, as it were, beyond uh, a, a Freudian um, uh, vision of secularism, because in a way what, what someone like Freud does uh, when he spatializes this idea of emotions somehow coming from below or from underneath or from some great depth uh, is he secularizes a metaphysical set of distinctions of above and below. Uh, what if we think about maybe 18th century visions of how uh, to visualize strong emotions? Um, one way of doing so was to suggest that in the argument of Norman or Brown that strong emotions such as hatred or love are actually transient. They, they, are, they are on the surface. Uh, they are about a play of the surface. Uh, and they are not linked to depth at all. What makes them so problematic is precisely because they are transient, precisely because they play themselves out on the surface. Uh, and the task, therefore, of all good people would be to uh, to ground personality in some version of depth. And, and the way in which this was primarily done in the 18th century, but also in some of the 19th, is to try to counterpose, as Norman or Brown argued, passions to interests. So what you needed to do in order to deal with the destructiveness of passions that were playing themselves out on the surface, that were transient by nature, was to ground yourself in interest. And one way to do that, or the primary way to do that, uh, was to link character and personality to property. Right? Uh, 
and interest is all in interest in something that you own. Often landed property, territorial property, but other forms of immaterial property as well. How do you ground yourself? Uh, you own, you either own yourself, you own your own emotions, you own land, uh, you own movable property, and that grounds you. That allows you to resist this transient play of emotions um, that I've been describing. And that's one reason, of course, why in the earlier days of uh, democracy in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, uh, you had property qualifications for voting rights. In order to be able to vote, you needed to be an owner of property, therefore generally male. And this was not simply a way of excluding others, though of course it was that as well. It was, uh, that kind of exclusion was based upon the argument that only people who own property of a certain kind are truly grounded in, the, in their societies. They possess interests. Uh, and therefore, they are not swept away by the momentary play of emotions, of hatred or love. Uh, that are transient by their nature. Um, and if you will, this, is, this then gets to be not only the, the fulcrum of, a, if you will, a capitalist uh, view of looking at the world, but comes to define uh, who we are and how we, define, and how we describe ourselves and how we understand our actions. Uh, and so all those movements and, pers and persons who desired from this period in the late 18th, early 19th century uh, to resist or to object to or to fight a world made up of interests which were meant to put aside or limit the play of passions on the surface uh, had to at the same time fight against the institution of property at the very heart of modern society. So interest and property, I'm arguing, uh, go together. Now, one of the ways in which communism, for instance, does this uh, famously is to, as it were, go through interest to the other side. Uh, so you need to um, privilege the idea of uh, proletariat, which is an interest group in a certain way. It is a capitalist category. Uh, and once you have the victory of the proletariat, the destruction of um, a, a capitalist class, then, of course, uh, you, um, uh, you uh, get rid of the state itself and so get rid of the logic of property and so interests. Uh, but this is not the only way in which to conceive uh, of um, a critique of interests. Uh, and if you look at the colonial world where European powers sought to institute interests where they apparently didn't exist precisely by instituting property rights very often, um, you have a different set of concerns coming up. Uh, and I'll focus here momentarily on probably the most famous anti-colonial figure in modern history, Gandhi, the Indian thinker Mahatma Gandhi, um, who basically says interests are impossible in at least two ways. In one sense, they're impossible because they cannot be universalized. Property, especially in a colonial society like India, cannot be universalized. Uh, um, so interests are limited by definition, they're exclusive by definition, and they're violent by definition. Um, the other limitation of interest, um, Gandhi suggested, is that it can never really get rid of or even limit in any appreciable degree the passions uh, which it is meant to do. Um, that those will always exist, just as violence will always exist. The question is, how do you transform it from one, one kind of thing to another kind of thing? So for Gandhi, if interests were not universal, universalizable, um, because property was not universalizable, uh, what was? How could you actually object to this world or structure of interests? Um, well, one way of doing so was to, as it were, give free reign to the passions that these interests were meant to limit. Um, and he does that by invoking the figure of sacrifice. All right. uh, now, of course, there's something very risky and dangerous in this manner of thinking, uh, because when you give free reign to these emotions, which are meant to be limited uh, by interest, um, 
you get the bad as well as the good. Uh, but for Gandhi, that risk was one worth taking. Uh, he thought that uh, you could only combat emotions like hatred and their violent consequences uh, by others such as love, uh, that they both followed a similar kind of logic. Um, the problem before him was how to prevent the excesses of this sacrificial form of anti-colonial action uh, that he specialized in demonstrating in his own person. And I, I probably not remind you of the kinds of things he did. Uh, fasting unto death, uh, facing um, uh, brute force, brute violence, uh, subjecting yourself to the potential or the possibility of being killed, and asking others to do so. Um, he found that rather than people being wary of this form of re resistance, if you will, um, he had to actually prevent them from volunteering in very great numbers and trying to, as it were, make these sacrificial acts uh, more common than they should, in fact, be. Uh, so the problem was the reverse of the one that the votaries of interest tend to describe to us. Uh, if we emerge from a world, or if we live in a world which is defined by interest and property, we think that these sacrificial forms are unthinkable. Uh, that, in fact, we are not, it's very difficult to get people to behave altruistically or in a sacrificial manner. But everywhere we see this is not the case. Uh, Gandhi's argument, for instance, is that we all know that in our daily lives, People sacrifice for each other. Parents sacrifice for their children. Children sacrifice for their parents. Lovers sacrifice for each other. Friends sacrifice for one another, etc. That this is a commonplace. Uh, if you can find it in the, in the in most minute relations of everyday life, then why can you not have it in the greater um, arena of political life and political relations? Uh, and he found out that it was, in fact, possible to do this. Uh, and that people would, were ready to volunteer um, to sacrifice many things, including their own lives. Um, but if for Gandhi the problem was, how do you rein in this form of sacrificial action to prevent people from conducting sacrifices which are not strictly necessary, the problem that faces us today uh, with, if you will, the anti-Gandhi uh, um, uh, someone like Osama bin Laden, who in a way is after Gandhi the greatest thinker of violence of our century, of sacrificial violence in our century. Uh, the problem he faces, he faces a similar problem. Uh, 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 that you have jihadis coming and volunteering to, as it were, blow themselves up and kill others in the process. Uh, like Gandhi, sacrifice was too easy. Uh, how do you actually rein it in? Um, uh, for Gandhi, you could rein in such forms of sacrifice precisely because they were linked to everyday social relations, that there was an everyday world uh, which could limit uh, these kinds of movements. The problem with, uh, uh, with bin Laden and bin Laden's world is that that everyday world no longer seems to exist, that it has been destroyed, uh, that there is no taken-for-granted, received view, received version of life and of doing things uh, that can limit the logic of sacrifice. So having just said something perhaps slightly coherent uh, about sacrifice, interest, and property, I want to go on uh, to do something uh, ever so slightly more interesting and talk about how these things manifest themselves in our own uh, um, politics, the politics of the contemporary. Uh, and what I want to suggest is that the kinds of things that were signaled by Gandhi on the one hand in colonial times and by bin Laden in the opposite direction uh, uh, at the very beginning of our century, uh, you see now widespread in contemporary forms of polit political and cultural life. Uh, that is to say that interest no longer seems to hold the fort. Uh, that the, the very thing that was meant to ground us and limit the play of passions seems to have evaporated. Um, and you can see this uh, very precisely with political parties in the West, especially in our times. Uh, the political party, after all, was constructed in order to represent interests, interest groups. Uh, 
but today, whether you're looking at the United States and the Republican Party, whether you're looking at India and the BJP, uh, whether you're indeed looking at France, uh, what you see happening is great political parties of long-standing duration being taken over by outside adventurers and, ho and, and entirely hollowed out. It's an extraordinary situation. Um, people like Mr. Trump, uh, or indeed the, uh, Mr. Monsieur Macron in France, seem to come out of nowhere um, to take over these great organizations. Uh, in the case of Macron, he literally uh, demolishes existing parties and builds his own. It seems out of nothing. Um, how is it possible to destroy the interests, the interest groups that seem to be so formidable, uh, the ones that had guided these political parties over many decades, if not centuries? Uh, how can one actually hollow out these preeminent forms uh, of interest uh, in our political life? Um, this, I think, is one great example of the volatility and the at least partial demolition of interest itself as a category and of social relations uh, uh, defined by interests and groundedness. Um, so that after these elections, whether in France or in indeed India or in the United States, you have a, a response which is strangely nostalgic. Uh, you have critics arguing, for instance, that, ah, well, this is uh, the rise of the working class, the revival of the working class, and they've all gone off to the Tea Party. They've all turned rightwards. Or this is the clever manipulation of the upper class, uh, or, you know, of, if you will, working class sentiments. These I take to be rather desperate uh, attempts to salvage uh, forms of interest, class, for instance, but also you might say race, uh, and sometimes gender, uh, that are precisely what are being winnowed away in our present situation. Uh, indeed, if, you, if one is to mention class at all in this circumstance, I think the class one should look at is the non-class, the lumpen, proletariat, if one is, is, is referring to Marxist terminology, which is to say the detritus of all existing and prior classes. There is no class. The very fact that in the United States, both the left and the right are anxiously uh, looking at something they think is a working class uh, that seems to have turned rightwards, I think suggests that no such thing really exists. Just as the middle class to which Hillary Clinton and all previous American politicians used to refer to was a myth, um, uh, so too is the working class uh, which we now think of as um, uh, becoming obscurantist um, and fascistic. Uh, what in fact seems to be happening is a reinvocation of a depth that is no longer with us, uh, thus turning to the initial um, uh, statement I began with, this presumption of depth that all emotion, hatred, as much as love, comes from the depths, comes from inside, comes from the past, uh, whether psychoanalytically or politically or in historically in many other ways. I think one of the things that's happening is that what we, when we see the rise or the revival, as it's often known, of racism or sexism or nationalism um, uh, or indeed religion, uh, what we are in fact seeing is the invocation, the exaggerated invocation of identities that are not in fact with us any longer. Uh, there is no continuous line. Uh, the very fact that they need to be exaggerated suggests um, that they are dead. They are these sort of strangely vampiric and ghostly um, figures. Uh, you can see this, if I can give you a few examples here, very clearly in the new way in which nationalism has become a big thing uh, in Europe, for instance. There, there are two forms of national awakening today. Um, there is a kind of strangely municipal form lacking in sovereignty, like the movement for Scottish independence on the one hand, or the, um, uh, the uh, movement for Catalonian independence, which presume the existence of the EU, which don't want sovereignty, which don't want their own currency. On the one hand, this kind of nationalism, uh, 
which is eviscerated of all traditional ideas of national belonging, loyalty, and patriotism. And on the other, on the other hand, of course, you have the UK Independence Party, uh, et cetera, et cetera. At the European level, you have these ideas of uh, European uh, civilization and culture, again, a highly contested uh, set of debates, which are contested precisely because there's nothing there to begin with. Uh, one reason, I think, why Islamophobia, this new term, has become so popular, one of many reasons, uh, is if you look at Isla Islamophobic debates and narratives, they are almost entirely phrased in the language of envy. Uh, the problem with Islam, the problem with uh, Muslims, is that they actually have this depth uh, of, uh, of passion, of feeling, of commitment, of loyalty that we Europeans lack. Right? Uh, and there, too, you see the game has been given away. Uh, the envious relationship with the other's uh, 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 depth, with the other's profound profundity, with the other's stability, is what uh, characterizes these new movements, which are themselves, therefore, uh, entirely about a play of surface. Now, the anthropologist Arjuna Padurai, I'll finish up uh, very quickly here. The anthropologist Arjuna Padurai gives a good example of this when looking at uh, what is known as communal or religious violence in India, uh, where you have a set of riots beginning in the 1990s. And the violence, which is very brutal and grotesque, that marks these riots uh, uh, he notices is laborious. You know, so not only do you spear uh, uh, you know, pregnant women and take out their fetuses and burn them, not only do you carve up their bodies and disembowel them, uh, these things, these brutal acts which have been seen generally as signs of the venting of a deep and entrenched and profound violence, deeply felt, he argues are in fact not that at all. Uh, they are superficial, he doesn't use that term, uh, they are epistemological, he says, they are not indeed emotional at all. What the, the thing that is happening here in this kind of laborious and unnecessary violence, after you have killed the person, what is the point of dismembering them in this manner? Uh, and he argues it's a forensic kind of violence. It's a violence in search of something, the otherness, the depth, the profundity, what makes that person someone else, someone whom you hate, what makes the enemy an enemy? Uh, there's an epistemological character to it, uh, which he finds fascinating. And I think this provides a very good example of my argument, uh, which is that uh, all the great emotions that play themselves out on the surface of our, cult of our cultural and political life uh, perhaps should be seen not as historical, not as emerging from some deep uh, and profound space of our own past, individual or collective, uh, but rather be, uh, have to be understood as being a play of, uh, uh, pl playing on the surface of things of our cultural and political and psychic lives. Uh, and I'll end by suggesting that, uh, since I invoked Islam, uh, that perhaps the best example of this is uh, militant forms of violence, um, which are so intense precisely because they are so brittle and so delicate and so much as it were on the surface. Uh, we saw this acknowledged as early as the 7-7 uh, bombings and the Al-Qaeda bombings in London, uh, because if you were to read the Intelligence Committee report that came out of those bombings, uh, the one thing that flummoxed the Intelligence Committee uh, was the fact that uh, indoctrination didn't seem to exist. Uh, that people seem to pick up and become violent, not because in an old-fashioned way they were indoctrinated, they were brainwashed, they were taken off into some dark room and people worked on them steadily. Uh, radicalization is not indoctrination, which is the Cold War idea. The problem with militant indoctrination or radicalization as opposed to indoctrination is that it is so rapid, it is so quick, it is so superficial, it doesn't come out of any depth. Its violence is linked not to depth, but to surface, and I will end there. Thank you. Thank you, Faisal Dashi, for this uh, incredible talk. And we will go on with our final speaker, who will give us um, a glimpse also, I hope, into his exhibition, which is exhibited here uh, at Transmediale, the Hate Library.
So uh, we're welcoming Nick Thurston, who is the author of uh, several books, club books and pocket books. Uh, he has been an associate and visiting lecturer at various art academies in the UK since 2007, and in September 2012, joined the faculty of the School of Fine Art, History and of Art and Cultural Studies at the University of Leeds. Uh, his pr print and sculptural works are held in public and private collections around Europe. His book words, works are collected um, also in various institutions, Tate, London, MoMA, amongst other institutions. And he has exhibited in shows at um, various contemporary art museums in Denver, uh, Toulouse, um, also at Whitechapel Gallery in London and other venues. So we're happy to have you uh, as the final speaker. Please welcome Nick Thurston. Hate means different things to different people in different circumstances. And inevitably, those different communities and their interpretations sometimes overlap and come into conflict. Even if, in theory, a general concept of hatred can be agreed, real life tends to complicate its applicability as an underwriter for anything like legal action. What exactly constitutes hate speech, or indeed a hate library, is therefore deceptively complicated. There are various derivative concepts already in use that filter the kinds of expressions and intentions we might gather under the umbrella of hate speech to establish more specific and applicable categories, like incitement or dangerous speech. For example, Susan Benesch and her team at the Dangerous Speech Project distinguish hate speech, which is hateful to some, from dangerous speech which motivates an endangerment of that group because it inspires violence. I'm not for a second here to suggest that art is the solution to this very real problem, or indeed any other real world problem. There are lots of amazing activists and research groups who do grounded social and policy work in the spirit of what we might call language critique or even counter speech. The best of them being well aware that the status of free speech is a similarly contested, if not gray, issue. For example, here in Germany, you have great work done by the groups like Debate D Hate. And over in the UK, there are bold and insightful scholars like Matthew Feldman, who collaborated with me on this project I'm going to discuss today. A version of that project is on show here in the foyer. It's called Hate Library and was commissioned by the Foxhall Gallery in Warsaw, where it was first shown last summer. In a few minutes, I'm going to talk you through some of the gestures that went into its making. And just before that, I'll explain briefly why I think radically public models of the library as art could be one space where a politics of thought and counterthought, speech and counterspeech, can be productively held together. Underpinning that discussion is my belief that the arts might be able to make some, maybe unique, contribution to broad and collective forms of counteraction quite precisely by embracing the eternal contest over the concept of what art is. Rather than prescribe that art must be a hammer or a mirror or a speculative act of wielding, I'm interested in the idea that it could be all of those things and more, all held together by a society as a web of productive contradictions. I'm invested in the idea that art is one form of culture that can hold things open, in public, as a specific and contestable knot of materials and concepts. But the kind of art that I find particularly interesting, and of which this project, Hate Library, is just one example, tends to display a certain set of commitments. Firstly, this kind of work treats languages as contextually specific and necessary lies. Not a noble lie in the platonic sense, but a present mark or gesture whose primary purpose is to represent something it's not. Secondly, this kind of work understands poetics as a committed exploration of the compositional and sociological potential of those lies. And thirdly, it leans on documentary modes of art making to deploy, at one of its extremes, the relatively simple practice of reproducing and sharing documents, effectively of publishing or republishing or making language public as a kind of documentary practice in itself. But before all of that, I want to start by borrowing an observation made by Matthew Feldman. It's a corrective 
one that helped me to understand why and how issues of radical right populism, ethno-nationalism, and even fascism are coming back into view, but are doing so out of focus. I found it a helpful way of understanding why our apprehension of these ideologies remains relatively blurry because of our out-of-date spatial metaphors. Most of us still use the spatial metaphor of a spectrum to describe political positions, stretching from a left to a right. That metaphor triangulates a center, the point between those poles, which then centers or anchors political viewpoints and discourse. All non-centrist political positions are judged by their distance from the center, left or right, from near to far. But it's easy to forget that where that center is at any one point in time on that spectrum can change. This is what's called the Overton window. The window constituting the center or mainstream isn't a static point, unlike the center point of, say, a circle. This political center is more like the contingent concentration of power in a particular socio-historic moment and place. And if the center moves, then so too does its proximity to the spectrum's poles, left and right. The center ground of contemporary mainstream politics in Europe has lurched rightwards, and the radical right has become more culturally and politically active. Simply put, the so-called far right is no longer very far away from our political centers, and it's the center ground that hedges most of our everyday experiences. We have a nearing extreme right, and continuing to call it far encourages a false sense of safe distance. Whether the blame for that lays with a lack of liberal resilience or whatever else, we do need to adjust our metaphors. If the so-called far right is getting closer, then we should be figuring out how to see it and hear it and read it and say it more clearly. It should be coming into view and we should be sharpening our blurred focus. At the moment, too often, it's like we're trying to use a telescope when we really need a pair of reading glasses. We need to learn to look in the right ways and in the right places, which means that we have to reimagine where and how we look. We should be nuancing a better common sense grasp of the specific and general features of radical right energy. To do that, we need access to its manifestations. We need the literacies to engage with them. And we need to have those experiences contextualized through informed discourses. That's a cocktail of needs that are paradoxically made both easier and harder to fulfill in our age of fluid public language and pluralized centers of power and community. To a large extent, I guess that I'm preaching here to the converted. We all know that the way we live is being radically transformed by the augmented interaction of digital network technologies, which largely do their work under the surface of life, while their effects and applications work on the surface of life. The recent successes of the AFD here in Germany are a good example of how this combination works in terms of our topic. Under the surface, they've tapped into the proliferation of user-driven online activism. And on the surface of everyday life, they've had unprecedented electoral success. I'm not saying that this correlation is simple, just that digitally-led mobilization is already recognized widely enough to merit attention. To even recognize that connection, let alone robustly critique how or why they are entwined, we have to make their interaction legible. We have to see it and hear it and read it to comprehend it. One imperfect way of doing that is to say it again yet differently, even if we disagree with its content. Saying it again is the easy bit. You repeat it, and that's never been simpler than digital capture and copy and paste allow. Saying it differently so that you don't just reinforce or monumentalize its significances is trickier. It's not necessarily about changing the content, but it is always about recontextualizing both that content's legibility and the experiences of reading it that we might have. Put simply, a documentary method of saying it again yet differently hinges on changing the modes of attention, not the testimony. When it comes to making legible the specific interaction between networked activism under the surface of life and its effects on the surface of lived experience, I think that even relatively simple recontextualizations can be potentially transformative. 
We need to shift its manifestations from the seemingly private circuits of individuals and their web-enabled devices into unavoidably social situations where the largely private mental experience of reading is done in relation to other people. We need to be reminded as we read that all of our personas and avatars are anchored by our actual world political subjectus. Because reading like that keeps the content in the same view as, in the same earshot as, in relation with our senses of social justice, of our social contracts, and of being with. Reading in communal situations tends to be conducive to discussing content rather than just commenting on it. When that content is potentially contentious, like all of the expressions that would fall under the umbrella of hate speech, those conversations may lead to civil debate, maybe even legal action, and maybe forms of counter speech. But how and where they are read makes a significant difference. Context, form, and content all matter inter-effectively in ways that late modern and contemporary art can do a good job of reminding us. Spaces for reading and discussing communally, without the pressure to be a customer, but with the freedom to listen and speak closely, are rare. You need a space that can hold that contentious con content together and welcome competing readings. It needs to hold those ideas and people together, but also hold them open. I think public libraries can be one of those rare platforms for doing just that. And I don't say that out of some kind of regressive form, regressive form of civic nostalgia. I also think that making temporary public libraries as artworks can be one way of using that platform to bring together or compose the interconnection of specific contents, specific forms of sharing, and specific contextual conditions. It's the speculative yet specific act of composition of art making which can enable this different kind of library making, that can, able, can enable a different kind of public library, one that's partial yet open and contestable for different kinds of engagements and readings. My project on show here at Transmediale stakes that wager. For about six years, I've been trying to bring together my literary and editorial work with my interest in the sociology of reading and public art by making temporary functioning public libraries as artworks. These artworks treat the gallery as a specific place with specific conventions and fill it with specific published holdings and contextualize the audience's access to them in specific ways. It is the most boiled down recipe for a public library and very different from the quiet neoclassical civic model. These spaces should be noisy and temporary and make unusual literatures available to be read and responded to. Hate Library is a public reference resource in this mold, and it has five and a half components. In a ring in the middle are 12 blue, or blue orchestra stands, spaced according to the design of the EU flag, but all turned inwards as communal reading lecterns. On each stand is one of 12 free-to-handle, comb-bound volumes. These are tiny samples of the ongoing public discussions between supporters of 12 of the most significant far-right groups from European nations, which have been exported from their original digital platforms and rematerialized here as history books. Each of these unedited volumes pauses one far-right national conversation, repeating it offline by using very simple data gathering and print-on-demand processes. Two of the three components on the false walls repeat a different lateral chain of conversation. The six lines of oversized blue text are a single poem made of printed hyperlinks. Each phrase included is the title of a discussion thread from a different public web forum, kept in the order they were found with only the duplicated titles removed. In the main space, the frieze of running columns are the results returned by searching for the term truth across the European sections of the internet's largest white supremacist discussion platform ordered chronologically until they fill the walls. Together, this freeze and thread poem are backdrops, and they signal the vexing growth of transnational cooperation between radical right groups, as enabled by digital network technology.
The final one and a half components run around the outside face of the three-sided wall. The sharpening problems of civic cohesion and free speech at the heart of this project are condensed in the poster poem on the back. In its frame, from back to front, yet big to small, an iconic photograph of Oswald Mosley addressing a fascist rally in 1930s London and a screen grab of the British National Party's Twitter feed sandwich a news media image of pro-EU liberals marching in Warsaw. The slogan printed over the top remixes a pair of English colloquial word plays and a metaphor used in dramaturgical sociology. Through its combination of text and image, this poster tries to juxtapose the confusing overlap between public front stage and online activist backstage behavior. As used by far-right groups and parties, as well as the mobilization of PR-friendly strategies to conceal and legitimate the beliefs that unify their memberships. That same oversized piece of mirror writing, back to front truths, runs letter by letter along the wall. In ways that are blunt, maybe even too blunt, the contest over truths and truth claims are at the heart of this library, all of which is obviously skewed by my subjective concerns <clears throat> as its librarian and as a poet. It's partial in both senses of the word as incomplete and biased. For example, why not gather material from the far left? The potential I see in this kind of speculative public library is that it eschews the supposed neutrality of the civic model. It's too public or excessively public. From its catalogue to its contents, it hinges upon my personal concerns and my small portion of fines. And it amplifies the semi-discreet personal discussions of registered community members into printed testimonies. It exports them into testimonies said on the old media record. At the heart of all this is the idea of taking responsibility for a public language act, as in itself a kind of authorial act, which I've argued for many years is a key gesture in contemporary poetics. But that same idea is the basis for international legal debates about whether or not social media tools are neutral platforms or responsible publishers. Hate Library tries to explore that by very simply documenting just a few of the stances adopted by nearing right and right wing fringe communities. Neither the data set nor its collection are robust enough to be evidence for any kind of lazy generalizations. It's just a lumpen slice of real communication and it's lyrically selected in the spirit of the long history of documentary poetry as something that's an odd mix of literalism and allegory. For me, what readers do with it is what matters. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Nick Thurston, and thanks again to all of you for the talks. Um, I will re that we immediately open for discussion. So remember the two microphones in the aisles. Uh, you're invited to ask questions. Um, and I think uh, a good way to get into discussion maybe, also, I mean, you are invited to respond to, respectively, to each of your talks, obviously. Um, and I think one very, very, very evident and obvious way to do that um, is by kind of revisiting the relations and tensions all of you open up in your respective talks. So that would be um, in Zibilla's talk, the kind of uh, surface and transparency or visibility of the paper in contrast to the algorithmic workings um, in the depth of the opacity and then obviously uh, making uh, the surface vital for looking at emotions instead of uh, conceptualizing them as coming from the depth. And then uh, with you, you also talked about uh, um, visibility and invisibility of the workings or effects of the media. Uh, also, I find it very interesting to further think of this tension between um, near and far and how to kind of revisit or revision uh, the very term of far right or what that means if we conceptualize it like that and maybe reinvent the language. So I think that might be a good way to start a discussion and I will leave the floor to you and also look at the microphones. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I guess we have uh, opacity, depth and distance 
or visual spatial metaphors, right? And that seems to run through. Um, I, for, for my part, in terms of this near and far difference, and back to this analogy of the difference between a telescope and a reading glass, I guess, um, it comes down to, to learning to read differently, right? to, to developing literacies of seeing more closely or differently and looking in different places. I think you know, part of what a lot of really interesting um, scholars but also activists and practitioners who are engaging with this material have already noticed is that it can't be about old distinctions between, say, close reading and new forms of like distance or shallow reading. But it has to, to deal with these kind of complicated fluid networks, the multi-platform relations. You have to see those things as potentially productive collaborators, um, the close and the shallow and the distant. Does either of you want to react? At the moment, I don't know the question. But there is a woman. Yeah, there's there? a question. Uh, no, I thought maybe. <laughs> <laughs> there will come a question. Please. Yeah, yeah, there's a question. So we can also take the question, please. Hi. Floor is yours. Um, thank you all. It was amazing to listen to all this. I, I have lots of ideas, but I'm not going to tell them. I just want to ask how is it possible to make a critique of the surface? And uh, can we think of deafness of surfaces, like deafness in surface? And what is a surface, kind of like... Yeah, a critique of surface, please. <laughs> Thank you, if I'm free to answer. I like surfaces, because I'm wondering about uh, our normal rhetoric in the Western society is, as we already know, Depth is good, and being on the surface is superficial. But the interesting thing is that whenever humans are acting in an aesthetic or a, a thoughtful way, they are transforming bodies with three dimensions in something flat to be inscribed, painted, uh, whatever. And I'm asking myself, what is the productivity of reducing three-dimensionality to two-dimensionality? And I think the interesting thing is, I have no eyes in my back. Whatever is behind in the uh, three-dimensional uh, environment, whatever is behind cannot be controlled. And our illusion is, by inventing flatness, that we are creating a kind of space which is really overseeable, controllable, and so on and so on. And, the, and we have diagrams, maps, scripture, pictures, all this stuff all is using flatness. And now with the interface, something is changing. And I'm wondering one, once more again, because now a kind of depth is emerging, which is uh, combined with in transparency or non-transparency once more again. And therefore, in a special way, we have to fight for being able to work with surfaces again, but in a manner that these kind of surfaces do not have something behind which cannot be controlled and judged and so on and whatever by ourselves. And therefore, we have to find the politics of being superficial. And I know very interesting philosophers in my back. So, so to, for example, Wittgenstein had a flat ontology. Whatever exists shows itself. And I think this principle, uh, existing is being seen, is a very interesting thing. And we should fight for this principle of how to organize our environment once more again, because the tendency is in the opposite direction. You know? Getting the sensory environment, I don't see nothing whatever happens with my data and whatever. We have two more questions lined up, so please. Hi, 
Um, firstly, thank you for the very interesting speeches. There's a lot of food for thought, I think, in everything that you guys discussed. Uh, my question is a more practical one, because each of you sort of address strategies for uh, counter speech and um, creating a critical discourse. But I would like to know, um, well, basically, it's on the problem of uh, preaching to the converted. How can we reach a wider audience with these uh, counter speeches and acts of uh, resisting? Well, I think it actually doesn't involve such a great effort, if I might say so, precisely because, um, as Sibyl was saying, if one takes the surface seriously, uh, then it's all there to see. And it's, uh, uh, if one recognizes what's happening uh, in front of us, um, the, in the intervention becomes much easier. Uh, let me give you an example of that. So, since I spoke about Gandhi, you know, Gandhi insisted on uh, taking everything at, say, at face value, and let's invoke the title of this, this year's Transmediale. Uh, and he did so for at least a couple of reasons. One, because anything that was not at face value uh, was either unsayable or could not be brought into language. Um, or, and the, and the other reason is because in his view, nonviolence and social life had to play themselves out on the surface. So his, one of the things I was trying to say in my little presentation, or which was actually far too long a presentation, was that when we, we, while we tend to think of deep emotions as being precisely deep, uh, we end up modeling them on the interests, uh, which from the 18th century have staked a claim to such depth. So when you think about contemporary critique, it, 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 it tends to be often of the detective's variety, a policeman's variety. We want to look at something behind the phenomenon. What exactly is it? What are the class interests? Uh, what are the inheritances of race? Uh, what, are, what, are, what are the forms of misogyny? What, now, obviously, there is racism, and there is sexism, and there is all that stuff. But why do we need to conceive of these things when adopting a critical attitude as if we were detectives looking for the interests behind uh, some phenomenon. Uh, what if you don't look for things behind? What if you don't look for interests? What if you actually take things as they present themselves to you on the surface and you might do so nominalistically? Uh, there are many, there's more than one philosophical way in which you, which you can do that. And Sibylla mentioned Wittgenstein, I mentioned Gandhi. You can also think about nominalists philosophers. Um, uh, if you discount the backstory, as it were, what's behind, which is an invitation to open up, to survey, um, uh, to grasp, to conquer, uh, that mode of critique is violent in a way that is indistinguishable from colonial and masculinist and other forms of violence. So what if one actually uh, restrains oneself from that? How then is it possible to think about critique as being something that's not about opening up the depths? Uh, it sounds like a, a, a difficult thing to do, but actually it isn't. Uh, it just requires um, a, a certain form of recognition, uh, and we are too lured by these languages of uh, the hidden that needs to be revealed. Okay, um, this was a question that came up during um, Faisal's presentation here also, where you talk sort of about uh, an emptying out of, of depth, but also um, the, an emptying, there is also a temporal implosion here also. You talk about the sort of uh, lack of importance of, of the pasts and interests, and you talked about how uh, this um, surprised at how rapid the sort of radicalization happens and, and so on. And it got me thinking also of another uh, figure or concept that was discussed uh, some years ago uh, in relation to sort of the, the political movements of, in Europe, but also the Arab Spring, which is the idea of the graduate without a future. 
which is also uh, someone who has sort of emptied out their, their selves by investing everything into a future that has now evaporated. And um, there's also there sort of an implosion of, of a temporal uh, dimension. Um, so I wanted to ask what, what, what role sort of this uh, plays in this kind of uh, strong passions on the surface that uh, the, the tem temporal dimensions are also imploding and especially kind of the, uh, the idea of the future or, or the disappearance of uh, futures. I think it was addressed to you actually, but well, maybe we can share it. But a, maybe you can share in, the answer, right? <laughs> in an answer. And I'm sorry to drone on about Gandhi, but uh, uh, in this case, it's actually quite opposite, uh, because he thought that um, any form of politics or indeed ethics that was future-oriented was deeply violent, because it was instrumentalizing uh, the present and the past. Uh, and so his sort of ascetic, if you will, form of practicing nonviolence was to behave as if one lived only in the present. Uh, how do you actually inhabit the present? His argument was that we don't inhabit the present because we're driven by either the past or the future. But we can never really control the future. By inhabiting the present, and he did so by saying things like, look, the, unlike other moral philosophers who think that the adult male is the, uh, is the ideal uh, ethical agent, people like Gandhi thought it was women and children. Uh, the child is someone who is fully, uh, 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 who's, uh, who doesn't control his own future or her own future and therefore is capable of living entirely in the present. If you live in the present, you actually open up the future to other kinds of possibilities. You attend to what is incalculable about the future. And for him, that was really crucial because a future pre previewed, a future seen in advance is, uh, what is that uh, a phrase, a kind of uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, so now I'm not recommending this as we all should stand around and live entirely in the present, but I'm suggesting that there, this serves as a historical reminder of the different ways in which one can practice something that he called nonviolence uh, without then suggesting that we shouldn't uh, make plans uh, at all. So we have three questions lined up, so I will ask each of you to briefly ask the question and also for brief answers. Please, and then. Hello. <laughs> um, thank you for the talk. Uh, my question is a little bit for the three of you, but maybe a little bit more for Nick, but for three of you. Okay, I'm thinking that uh, Nick is talking about like speculative techniques or methods to like try to, to pose a different way of approaching the critique. Um, and I'm, well, I, I, I was thinking also of Don and Ravi that talk about the speculative methods, but uh, they also talk about uh, finding preferable scenarios, which is a part of the critique that I never really see. Uh, we always see like the projects of art there, and then they leave us all depressed about how the world is terrible, but we don't see these spaces of preferable, like constructing the preferable scenarios. So the question is for all three now, like how can we maybe find these methods to, to build preferable scenarios with other people and maybe to use these emotions or these uh, metaphors of position depth to, to bring other discourses to, to people. Thank you. Yeah, it's a really good question. And, uh... I think it's something people are asking themselves a lot on the centenary of the constructivist revolution, right? Where at least you there had a model, flawed though it proved to be, of transformative making, right? The object plays the role of being the transformative agent for the viewer, subject, or audience member, right? Um, I'm not a constructivist, but I have absolute sympathy with your question, right? Like, how do we go beyond the critique to sort of forward action? Um, maybe my answer would link to the last question tangentially a little bit as well, because I think part of that is a temporal problem. Um, a lot of, certainly the, the kinds of communication networks that, that are explored in, in that exhibition out there are part of our kind of liquid modernity, and I'm thinking there of my colleague who passed away not long ago, Zygmunt Bauman. Um, and that liquidity is really hard to read, 
right, let alone to move beyond or change from. Um, and one simple gesture, uh, and it is very simple, and maybe it's simplistic, but one simple gesture is to pause that flow. And one way of pausing it is to stop it and print it and commit it to that old kind of media, the, the, the thing of, of, of printed language. Now, of course, that leaves you then with a false or misrepresentation of that ongoing liquidity, and, and that's the bind, right? I, I get that. So my answer would certainly not be that we should freeze everything and sort of try and dredge our way backwards. Um, but I think some pausing and some different kinds of reading alongside bigger approaches to kind of reading that can capture that ongoing movement would be healthy. So again, you have the close and the far or the, the, the near and the shallow going on at the same time. So I guess my, my, I hope not totally disappointing answer to you is that we need some combination of techniques and practices and we don't necessarily know what they are yet. And maybe that's part of the speculative intent, or that's maybe how that could be harnessed. Thank you. Let's take your question and then last year's. Yeah. Thank you very much for the three of you for the speeches. I'm referring to the first two of you, um, in especially to the concept of the dualism of the um, physical and the symbolical body and um, to the, the lack of depth uh, you claimed that um, um, results in, in a feeling of envy. In, and I, my question is to both of you, um, I think um, the concept of the individual honor of the um, symbolical body, for example, um, and the diff um, different conception in the cultures of this concept of individual honor um, what do you think is uh, the relation um, in, in all this uh, topic? Okay, for me the answer is not very difficult. If I want to explain why is uh, violence by language possible? Why? Because language is not a thing. You all know that. Then the only answer is we have two faces and we have two bodies. There is the physical face, but we have a social face, reputation, honor, and all this. And we have to look at this. In my talk, I uh, separated it in a very conceptualized way. I know it. But in reality, the corporal side of the face and the symbolic uh, face constituted by uh, being recognized by the speech of others and the behavior of others. In reality, there is a synthesis of both. You cannot separate it. And I think to understand what it is to be a human being is to understand that our corporality, our somaticity, has these double side of the physical and the symbolic. Perhaps I can address this, if I can, uh, by uh, this question of envy that you raised, by talking about the intimacy it creates between supposed enemies, uh, but looking at it from the other side. So take the famous or infamous set of uh, mobilizations and acts of violence over uh, insults to Muhammad, right? The protecting the honor of Muhammad. Big topic in Europe. For a number of years now. If you look at those acts of mobilization, they are fascinating. You might ask yourself, for instance, why is it only Muhammad who can be insulted and not God? Surely God is more holy. God cannot be insulted. No one will rise in defense of God. Why do you rise in defense of Muhammad? Well, one reason why is because Muhammad has been stripped of his metaphysical character and he's become vulnerable. He's become, as so many Muslims who seek to defend him argue, like your uncle or your father or something, he's become mortal. He's no longer a semi-divine or a theological figure. Uh, so the, the debate resolves itself, as it were, on a, in a secular terrain, not on a religious terrain at all. Indeed, and this is where the envy and the intimacy comes from, the invocations of blasphemy by Muslims are in almost every case 
uh, references to Christianity and to European forms of blasphemy. That term does not exist in Islamic theology as a generic uh, category. Uh, and it, uh, it emerged during the Rushdie affair in the, in the first mobilized, global mobilization for the Muhammad uh, by invoking what was then a law of blasphemy in Britain, which was subsequently nullified. That's the only way in which they could claim a theological character to their mobilization via Christianity, by a kind of almost envious intimacy uh, with the enemy uh, themselves. Otherwise, there's a kind of uh, uh, a flattening out onto a secular uh, a stage. So it's, it's, it's not the differences I find that are extraordinary here, but the, the, the intimacies that are absolutely crucial, which result in, a, if you will, a narcissism of minor differences, uh, if anything. Thank you, and the last question, please. Hi, thanks, very interesting panel. Um, my question is for Faisal. Um, I'm very curious about your surface level scholarship uh, chat. Um, in terms of how it plays out in what I look at, I look at AI and algorithms and the social and ethical implications of what happens to already marginalized groups because of algorithms. And the only way to look at this is to dig beyond the surface and open it up. If we don't open up and look at how algorithms work, we won't see anything. So if we take it at face value, we don't necessarily see these things. My question is, how does your call for this surface level scholarship benefit someone who's looking at things like I do in terms of issues of race and discrimination and bias? But as all the other questions, it's, it's a big question which cannot seriously, seriously be answered uh, on a panel such as this, but uh, I want to suggest a couple of things. One is, it's what I began my little presentation on, that often we're dealing with a trick of language, uh, but we take it far too seriously, uh, that there is a way in which you can conceive of distinctions and differences which are not based on surface and depth. Uh, if you think in reference to the previous question, temporarily, that's not necessarily, even if there's a historical, you don't have to think about it as being up and down or even, uh, you know, on, on a kind of continuum. So um, uh, there's a way, there must be a way in which one can think about and voice uh, problems, contradictions, uh, and questions uh, that refuse to gesture always to some kind of hidden realm which needs to be explored in a gesture that might be inevitably violent. So what someone like Gandhi is doing is, is uh, uh, in a kind of uh, exemplary way, um, practicing uh, in public a form of ethical social relations um, by trying to hold people to make them true to themselves by reading on the surface all the time, by saying, okay, I take what you say at face value, let's make an argument on that level, and can you actually act in the way you say you are acting? So it literally is about surfacing. It's an ethical, it's an, a moral act that he's performing. And that we can do without, um, uh, 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 without giving up on uh, um, um, difficulty without giving up on explication, uh, which is what reading and education are all about. But to, to get to the issue of identities and race, for instance, I think in a way it is far more interesting, at least as an experiment, to think about these forms which might be very, um, uh, how should I put it, uh, they are uh, very strongly held, like strong emotions. Uh, how do you think about them without constantly referring to backdrops and backings, either historical or psychic or personal? So let me give you an example uh, uh, which gets to the race-religion issue that you raised here. You know, nowadays, after 9-11 especially, we constantly hear good liberal and leftist scholars talking about Islamophobia, which exists, but also talking about, in order to counter it, the long history of Muslims in Europe, right? Uh, 
I would say to that, actually, Muslims have not existed in Europe uh, until the 1980s. And I'll say that because if you look at a country like Britain, the my, immigration of Muslims from South Asia especially, starting in the 1950s, um, when they migrated in the 1950s, they were not defined by, they, ha they had religions, but they were not defined religiously. They were defined both self-defining and by the state, defined by race and nationality. They were called Asians or Indians and Pakistanis and Bangladeshis or whatever. It's only in the 1980s, and I think crucially at the moment with the end of the Cold War, which is where the Rushdie event uh, affair happens, that suddenly you have an interesting switch and people who had been Asians or had been Pakistani suddenly become Muslims. Um, and it's, I think that is a, a far more fruitful and interesting way of thinking about history in small terms, not in big terms, uh, that are um, uh, uh, you know, histories of age-old oppression. So I would like to separate out the histories of oppression that no doubt exist if you look at, you know, from American slavery today to American racism today, clearly there is a connection. But it's breaking, uh, it's breaking that line, making sure that it's not a straight line, that there are moments and possibilities within that history uh, that allow you to open them up in different ways and other kinds of possibilities uh, that emerge both historically and therefore in the present and future that I think is so, uh, so crucial here by taking on the story of homogenous uh, and uninflected oppression even, I think we are putting ourselves in a really bad place. Um, it's, it's really necessary to break that story, the story of oppression uh, as much as the story of the oppressed, because they are linked uh, one to the other. I have only to add a very short idea to put, the, to put things on surfaces uh, means to see differences, to accept differences, to recognize differences, but not in a hierarchical order, because the ordering on the surface is uh, nebeneinander, I, beneath, uh, I do not know the English word, but yeah, you teacher. know it. Uh, next teacher. Okay, you understand me what I mean. In a non, the ordering in a non-hierarchical manner of differences, not of uh, doing putting all in the same, uh, in the same direction. Um, just a, a tiny, oh. <laughs> well, I, I would only add, and, and hopefully this builds on my last answer, give you a slightly better one, but whatever way forward there might be, it seems like it does need to be productively accepting of the conflictual. And, you know, with these kind of, uh, even uncomfortable differences can't be bottled back up. I think we socially recognize that. But I'm not just talking here about conflicts between opposing groups or differences of opinion. I'm talking about you know, the importance of a, of a way forward accepting individuals having conflicted feelings, of not being sure. Right? I think that's really, really important. It has to be accepting of not being sure, and so not be about waiting for a kind of regulative principle to move forward with. So uh, we're actually way ahead of time, so, uh, way over time, I meant. So that only leaves me with uh, thanking you, the audience, and especially thanking all the three speakers. It was a very interesting panel, and I'm uh, still very happy to have moderated it. So thank you, have fun at Transmediale, and maybe continue conversations.